Speaking of which, I was just practicing a nearly impossible new move that I call the Nasty Nork. You know, it's funny you say that, Hunter. That's also what I call my signature sex maneuver. Thank you to all you wonderful specimen for your comments and incredible support on the last video. Oh, and you get a shout out too, Travis, because you asked nicely. Leave a comment down below to be featured at the beginning of the next one. And with that, I hope you enjoy. Spyro 1 was a bit of a mixed bag for me. Going into it with high expectations as the franchise is the rival to Crash Bandicoot, I was left a bit disappointed by the awkward controls, pathetic boss battles, and at times tedious collectathon style gameplay. However, at the core, there was plenty of potential yet untapped thanks to the great level structure, combat variety, and precision platforming. And this and then some was kicked up several notches in Spyro 2. More world building, better characters, be it protagonists or antagonists, actual boss fights, mini games to give some much needed spice even if some of them were bullshit. Spyro 2 was near perfection so the bar has been set sky high for the trilogy's concluding entry. And the game starts off pretty strong with the series most ambitious story to date. But really who gives a shit about that because now you can select these cute little save icons for your files. Spyro, Sparks, Hunter, Douchebag, Zoe 101, and who the fuck is that? An unspecified amount of time after the events of Spyro 2, our story begins in the Dragon Realm. Suddenly a hooded girl emerges through these weird rabbit hole things with her little baby right on, storming through the dragon territory, stealing the dragon eggs. But this dumbass steps on Hunter's tail. <laughs> Waking all the dragons up, but her and her minions narrowly escape with all the eggs, which of course leads to Hunter and Spyro giving chase. We come to find out that this thief is Bianca, an apprentice sorceress under... The Sorceress. And she sounds like Frieza before the nicotine addiction. I hate you! And with that, your objective is set. Get the dragon eggs back and take down the sorceress. Try as she might to do everything she can to stop you from collecting the dragon eggs, it's evident pretty early on that Bianca isn't all bad. Even after being attacked by Bianca, which, by the way, who does she get her comebacks from? Vegeta? But I think we can look after ourselves. Try looking after this! I have to admire your ability to stand up after that. And I admire your ability to die! Hunter just thinks she's cute. How ironic, the pussy get once a mime not finishing that sentence. She never comes across as a real threat and mainly serves to build up the sorceress as the big baddie. Bianca doesn't want to hurt you unlike the sorceress who wants all the dragons dead. Fuck. This revelation sparks Bianca, who looks way too happy hearing about this, to make a full turn to the good side which had been teased throughout the game. At one point, she tries to create a monster out of a rabbit, but when the beast turns on her, Hunter jumps in to save her, and this is when a connection really starts to form between her and our heroes, especially Hunter. <laughs> Learning of Bianca's rescue at the hands of Hunter, the sorceress imprisons him, but even when encumbered, Bianca brings him food. Directly after learning that the sorceress wants the dragons dead so she can harvest their wings for an immortality spell, Bianca sets him free, and this is when she becomes a full-fledged ally to him and Spyro. I mean, I don't know why Bianca followed this jerk off around in the first place, but... It turns out that the dragons are the source of the sorceress's magic, but the sorceress was unaware of this when she banished them from the now-forgotten realms, the place where they used to rule 1,000 years ago. Wait a sec, dragons ruled the world? Ever since then, her magic and life force has steadily slipped away, but by creating an immortality spell, she can rid herself of the dragons once and for all while also not having to worry about, you know, death. The Forgotten Realms are of course the setting of the game and home to four hub areas. Sunrise Spring, Midday Gardens, Evening Lake, and Midnight Mountain. Each of these hubs are home to one new character who has been captured by the sorceress and has hired none other than that bumbling oaf money bags to keep them locked up. However, they can be unlocked once you pay that obese, idiotic, honey-inhaling, spineless, pompous, money-grubbing, moronic, derpy, gluttonous, fat, swamp as fuck! A small fee. Because this greedy dumbass can't even keep these guys caged up for the goddamn sorceress and he... Pays for it. When each of them kick his honey stuffed ass, and it is quite the cathartic little thing to witness. But what is even more satisfying is when you get to pummel him yourself or all your gems back at the end of the game. However, many of the gems you collect are not going to be collected by Spyro himself, but rather our four new friends I alluded to a moment ago. First up is Sheila the Kangaroo. She controls very similarly to Spyro, and in my opinion is easily the most polished out of the four new playable characters. Well, there's actually six new playable characters, but 
We'll get to that. Anyway, she can jump, double jump, mega jump, kick, and stomp, which is her take on Spyro's head bash. And she moves a bit faster than Spyro does when he's normally walking. While Spyro specialized in horizontal style gameplay due to his gliding, she's more of a specialist in the vertical aspect of things due to her mega jump. She's Australian because of course she is, is generally friendly and easygoing, but will literally kick ass if it comes down to that. I like her a lot. She's also a terrorist. Ah! Speaking of kicking gum and eating ass, Sergeant British Bird is a no-nonsense military sergeant. Although he quite funnily picks at the gaping plot hole as to why he couldn't just blast himself out of his cage. These are the latest military hardware. DBX-9 rocket launchers, state-of-the-art. So why didn't you use them to escape? <laughs> Because he's equipped with missiles, can fly, pick up objects, and he looks like he has seen some shit! Even though he's way too floaty, he's still decently fun in my book. Seriously, I have a book, The Lusty Argonian Maid. Give it a read, if you're over 18, of course. <laughs> Looking at Bentley the Yeti, you'd think he'd just be a brainless brute who smashes shit, but it turns out he's actually pretty sophisticated and has an expansive vocabulary. Why, you brazenly avaricious, duplicitous, larcenous ursine! I have no idea what you're saying. He does indeed smash shit, as I said, but you can also use his club to deflect incoming attacks. Although he's on the slower side, his simple yet destructive playstyle keeps him pretty fun for me personally when he's not being haphazardly thrown into boxing matches cause his brother's a cowardly milk drinker who has a seat ready for him at Weenie Hot General with his name on it. And finally we have Agent 9, an excessively trigger happy monkey who's gone completely... Yeah. He's practically a pre-pre-pre-alpha test drive of Ratchet and Clank. He can throw bombs, fire lasers with his blaster, and even has a sniper mode. However, he has no real lock-on for his blaster and his strafing feature is awkward as hell. You can use R1 or L1 to strafe right or left, however, when you do, you will be locked into moving into that direction. In Ratchet and Clank games, years down the line, you can hold down R2 or L2 to enable strafe mode, but you can still move freely. Here, he's just so... Monkey. Unlike Spyro, who besides that godforsaken turning that I swear I'm the only one who has ever had a problem with, is as smooth as ever. He's still great fun to glide and charge and flame all over the place with, and he even keeps his abilities he learned from the last game, like swimming and head bashing. And... climbing ladders. Wow! Levels are colorful, diverse, and oozing with the typical personality you've come to expect from the geniuses at Insomniac. Alongside the dragon eggs, you as per usual also collect the jet. <clears throat> I said you collect the jet. Normally the gems are supposed to gravitate towards you when you get near them, but this glitch happens at least once a level to me where that just doesn't happen? I've complained about how tedious the gem collecting can be at times with this series, and this bullshit is not doing the game any favors. Also not doing this game any favors is the lack of cutscenes before and after each level like there was in Spyro 2! They were a huge, memorable highlight and went a long way in building the world you're playing in, and making everywhere you travel to feel like a place that existed before Spyro's arrival and would continue to exist after his departure. <sighs> Regardless, the levels are still as creative as they've ever been, like I said, Enchanted Tower Spiraling Towers, Firework Factory and its rivers of lava and grand castles, and Crystal Island's blissful landscape and atmosphere are just a few of the incredible set pieces. Oh, and you can't forget the ASMR penguins of Frozen Altars. Would you mind taking my place? Dragon eggs are of course scattered throughout every level. Sometimes they're just out in the wide open and easy to find. However, others can be really cleverly well hidden, but not absurdly hard to find like some of the secret routes of Spyro 1. And before anyone gets on me about Crash Bias, yes, Crash 2 pulled off this bullshit too sometimes, and don't even get me started on Crash 3. Not only are the Dragon Eggs retrieved simply through exploring the different landscapes, but also through the returning minigames, and oh boy, I've got a lot to say about these. There's some really fun minigames like the Whirlpool Tunnels, the Golden Goose Hunt, and the Skateboarding Challenges when Hunter's not harassing you. Sheesh, what happened? I could beat these guys with my tail tied behind my back. Shut the fuck up, Hunter! You couldn't beat Joe Swanson in a game of hopscotch! Oh. You bitch! The speedway challenges make their triumphant return as well, but the tasks you're prompted to complete by Sparks are for gems only. You have to find Hunter hiding somewhere out in the level in order to activate the Dragon Egg Challenge. This was a thing in Spyro 2 with the orbs, obviously, but I didn't touch upon it because I didn't even need to do any of the speedway since I already had enough orbs to get into Dragon Shores. I mean, when Hunter's hiding spots are this bullshit, can you 
you really blame me for blowing them off? As for the challenges you get assigned by Hunter, it's basically just killing space farm animals most of the time. They're wacky, but they control super smoothly, so they're also really fun. And for our final playable character, we have Sparks, the thing that's been protecting you throughout this entire trilogy, like Aku Aku, who I somehow forgot to mention this entire time. Yay! Sparks' levels can be accessed after beating the world's boss. They're a top-down view arcade-style minigame where you have to venture through many different corridors and rooms, collecting gems and poning noobs until you reach a mini-boss at the end of the level. Sparks can charge, fire, use power-ups for more potent attacks or temporary invincibility, and after beating the level, not only do you receive a dragon egg, but Sparks also learns a special ability to help Spyro throughout the rest of the game. Spyro can grab gems from further away, let Spyro take an extra hit on top of the four he can already withstand, open treasure chests, warp to any level through the game's atlas, and in my opinion, the most important one of all, you can hit all the shoulder buttons at once to point you in the direction of the nearest gems. This function alone would improve the gem collecting across all three games tenfold, and I really wish the developers thought of this sooner. Overall, Sparks' levels were a pretty harmless experience and are actually not the only parts of the game to feature mini-bosses. Between fights with a mechanical shark, two boring-ass dragons, and this jabroni from the icons, and that is where all my enjoyable times with Spyro 3 come to a screeching halt, because from here on out, things get pretty rough. Earlier, I said that Bianca doesn't want to hurt Spyro and Hunter, which is true, as she only wanted to scare them. The sorceress gets tired of her bullshit and gives her a spell book, and this is how the bulk of the bosses throughout the game are conjured up. Sadly, they're all quite mediocre. Buzz is the first boss you face and all you really have to do is bash him into the surrounding pool of lava and Sheila will be there to bop him in the noggin. He hops around, occasionally tries to run you over, burn you, but all in all he goes down pretty easily. The music is unbelievably good here though and is one of, if not my favorite track in the whole trilogy next to Ripto's theme. Up next is Spike who uses his blaster to fire plasma balls at you. Every now and then a ball of magma will appear on the ground from the surrounding area which you need to headbutt into him. Sergeant Bird also drops down power-ups like a stronger flame breath and crystals that explode on impact. He's better than Buzz but still nothing too special unlike his music which is very special. Scorch is the final one of the Sorceress's Beast and his design is fucking sick! Beginning the battle he erupts with power scattering blasts all over the arena and as the battle rages on assist you with a steady provision of combustible projectiles and he even spits out minions who run towards you with TNT crates among other cronies he's a bit overwhelming at first but once you get the hang of it he's laughably easy just like the previous foes once you collect at least 100 dragon eggs you are able to take on the sorceress and wow how epic is this because my game glitched and gave me this Wii Sports ass music and it's a shame because the intended music like most of Stuart Copeland's tracks is pretty good so the sorceress hurls all kinds of crap at you with her scepter while agent 9 shoots down turrets and hovercrafts and flying saucers who the hell thought it was a good idea to put these clumsy sluggish unpolished arbitrary vehicles in the final boss of the trilogy and why is agent 9 the only one helping out here what about sheila sergeant bird bentley hunter bianca i was at least expecting bianca since you know she said she wants to help you take her down spyro never even interacts with the sorceress before this either this lady wants to kill the dragons and harvest their wings we got great banter between spyro and ripto several times throughout spyro 2 but we can't even get like a 15 second cutscene between these two? And while the sorceress's battle is hard, it isn't because she's a legitimate challenge, because the biggest challenge here is overcoming these terribly optimized controls for a battle like this. And yeah, I at least used the turret and hovercraft a couple times before this, but the saucer? No! I haven't even used this thing once up to this point throughout the whole goddamn game! What a disappointing, pathetic, unsatisfactory finale! Oh, I get it. They're saving the big climactic battle for the 100% end day. What the hell is this? We're both on flying saucers just blasting at each other, and that's it! You get the final leg of the game, one last cutscene where a baby dragon just burps, and that's the end! That is the finale to this roller coaster trilogy. 
This is easily the worst 100% reward in the series and easily the worst mini games I had to go through to get to this point. I had to play whack-a-mole with these brainless buffoons who were also trying to go after these moles who constantly kept getting in my way. Not that there's anything technically wrong with this mini game, it's just not fun at all. <laughs> Got stuck on this abysmal hovercraft demolition derby for nearly an hour because this junk shoots like shit and moves infuriatingly awkwardly like I'm not even in the arena yet, just give me a chance! I had to go through this dreadful shooting range with Agent 9 where bullets didn't even seem to register against these assholes and sometimes you don't even have a chance to defend yourself yourself because within a millisecond these rootin' tootin' pieces of shit are riding your ass, dual wielding pythons while sticks of dynamite are hurtling towards your head faster than a Randy Johnson fastball. Oh, oh and this dumbass race against the yetis after you've collected everything in the game, like, I'm done, I did what you asked me, just take me to the loot level, take me to the secret boss, just give me what I want! 90% of the reason I came this far was because the regular ending is underwhelming as hell and you know what? The regular ending is honestly way better than the 100% one! Mini games like the swimming tunnels might be hard, but when I died, I never thought this game is bullshit! When I died, I knew it was my fault. I knew I was the one in control and that I needed to keep improving in order to win. Whereas with the hovercraft and witch mini games, I either got by through sheer luck or by exploiting a weakness in the system. The skateboarding sessions against Hunter gave me some trouble, but they just took some time getting used to. I never ever thought that the game was at fault for my performance. Performance. Spyro fans know there's a general consensus that Spyro 2 also has its fair share of bull honky minigames. Saving the caveman, tailing the spy, and good old Trouble with the trolley, eh? Now that last one I'll give you. It sucks. <laughs> However, I personally never had much trouble with any other minigame throughout my entire experience. And that's the thing. Trouble with the trolley was annoying as hell, but by the end of the adventure, I pretty much forgot about it, and it had no real lasting impression on my opinion of the game. Games like that were nothing more than a speed bump, whereas these mini games are potholes plastered around every corner. If anything, sure, maybe Spyro 2 went a little too far with the variety, but it never actively hindered my experience because variety isn't an inherently bad thing. When that variety isn't fun, controls like shit, and steals the spotlight from the core gameplay I signed up for, like in Crash 3 to an admittedly much lesser extent, that's when variety becomes a problem. Variety was my biggest gripe with Crash 3, but it was still a spectacular game because it was backed by great bosses, perfected controls, logically sound extensions to the core gameplay, and legitimate challenges. When I eventually play the Reignited Trilogy down the line, I do hope to find that these games got the polishing they deserve. Mainly Spyro 1 and 3 because 2 was already perfect. <laughs> Spyro 2 left me with really high hopes for the threequel, but unfortunately this game is just rushed. No cutscenes before and after each level, it's the laggiest and glitchiest out of the bunch, at least in my experience. Sergeant Bird and especially Agent 9 are pretty unpolished, several minigames are way too slow, inaccurate, and or generally unoptimized. It desperately tries to be diverse because variety, it's the final entry in the trilogy, meaning quantity over quality, we have to throw absolutely every idea at the wall we have like Agent 9 flinging his poo. The Greatest Hits version even adds missing music, fixes bugs, and an entire missing cutscene because of how rushed this game was. And unfortunately, the version I own sold on the PlayStation Store for some reason is the original version and not the greatest hits version. Like, why? And to that you might say, well, it's not fair to be reviewing an unfinished version. But if they thought what they originally sold was good enough, then oh well. That's what I'll judge them on, because 2000 is not like today where you can just slap on a free 50 gigabyte patch and be done with it. It saddens me to say that I don't think I'll ever be touching this game again. Unless, like I said, there are some major tweaks made in the reignited version. This is not not a bad game by any stretch of the imagination, but it takes several steps back after Spyro 2 established how much more this series is truly capable of. And that is why this search for the baby dragons is nothing more than a scramble day. <laughs> Well, we've done it, everybody. The journey embarked upon almost eight months ago to review both the Crash and Spyro original trilogies is complete. From this point forward, I will be moving on to the Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank, and Sly Cooper series with some other videos sprinkled in along the way. If you missed or would like to rewatch any reviews on the trilogies thus far, click the cards you see on the screen now. Thank you all for your love and support. It seriously means the world to me, and I will see you soon with my Jerk and Dick Bird review. I take it back, this is the greatest game I've ever played.